And now software processes have evolved to such a level that we have many different names just to describe the successful branches of software. We have Agile, Lean, Scrum. We used to really care about Rational Unified Process. We have XP, we have Kanban. <laughs> and those are just the successful branches. So we have so many different ways of even doing it right that we had to come up with more than one name just to keep it straight. In physical manufacturing, they're still getting enormous benefit out of Lean the way it was ported in the 1960s. What Wikispeed has done is said the way you Lean, if we take it from the same base, but now it's really grown into a lot of different stuff and way more elaborate principles. If that's applied back to physical manufacturing, what happens? The final version of our XPRIZE race car that we campaigned in the XPRIZE, we built in three months, and that had never been done before. So it worked. We get from Agile reducing cost to make change in iterative development, from test-driven design, we have test-driven manufacturing, clear success criteria. From extreme programming, we take pairing and swarming, among other things. Scrum, we get almost everything. If we were going to sum it up, it'd be clearly defined roles and responsibilities, but as we all know, that's the entire structure of the team. From object-oriented programming, we get clearly defined modules, classes, and their interfaces, and contract-first design. From Kanban, we get work in progress limits, where we make sure someone's not overloaded and sinking. What are we giving up? Another slide for reference. I think we're close to time. I'm going to race through this. And what this slide represents is, when we make these decisions, every time we gain something, we lose something. And we want to be very deliberate about what we lose to make sure it's something we've mitigated elsewhere or we don't actually care about it because of our circumstance. Very often in software coaching, in any type of coaching or process, it's here's the benefits of this process. We have to make sure that what we lose, because everything we adopt has something that falls out the other end, is something we don't care about. So first, by minimizing cost to make changes, we innovate quickly. That adds time and cost to design, coupling points. Our chassis would be much simpler if it didn't have a contract to talk to these different modules. It'd be faster to make a one-off car the first time than make a car that's modular, and it would be lighter and it'd be less sophisticated. Uh, the maintenance would also be reduced. But we make that time back the first time we change a module, making it net net ahead. So yes, we add more time to add those interfaces to the car. The first change we make to the car, we come out time and cost ahead. By loosely coupling modules, we make changes in parallel. That requires multiple people with project manager skill for each of those changes happening in parallel. That was a good thing. We were rapidly ramping up people to be Agile Lean Scrum project managers because we needed to, to get advantage of the velocity we needed. So we had every incentive to make as many people as smart and skilled as possible. So that's actually a net net positive. Oh no, you have a more skilled team. So not really <laughs> much. <laughs> By working collaboratively in shared space, we unblock quickly. Some folks thought it would be distracting. How are they going to think and solve these complex problems in a room with power tools going on and people working on completely different parts of the problem than they're touching? We found dramatically increased velocity. And we get to have this ridiculous sounding buzzword, 100 miles per gallon car in three months. So yes, uh, it, it ended up being dramatically improved velocity despite some people coming into the situation thinking it's just going to be too difficult to focus. By first automating tests, we quickly know if we have improved. That adds time and cost to design the test before we even start work or start solving problems. But we get that time back by killing work early that is damaging our success metrics. Also, it boosts morale, which boosts velocity. Tests are success criteria. There's no downside. It's harder to micromanage your people, maybe, so no downside. <laughs> Team morale is a multiplier for velocity. The only downside would be that you now have to be interfacing with your team in an open and honest way. So again, no downside. Iterations and subs make for constant successes. Folks might see rapidly replaced modules as waste. We're always recycling components. Isn't that waste? And isn't the whole tenant use less stuff? Right? We're even physical. If we make a change to a suspension module, what happens to the previous suspension module? Isn't that the waste you were just saying you want to avoid? Actually, less waste than delaying enhancement until the next vehicle build. So if someone says, I can get us another two miles per gallon by making this change to this module, if we weren't modular, we'd have to wait till the next car build to know if that even works. But this way, we're able to rapidly implement, implement, uh, implement incremental improvements. 
Why doesn't all business move this way? Yeah. Old thought business wants to yeah. be predictive. They ask us for the five-year business plan. New thought business examples like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Google didn't even have a business plan, and yet they're some of the financial giants of our time. Interesting. Forecasting revenues to attract or keep investors is a reason why businesses want to be predictive and not embrace Adeline and Scrum. Something I didn't know before we uh, uh, is that a lot of the loans, or the, you can call it a loan, the venture capital given, to startup companies like Wikispeed equates to a 25% APR loan, and then they reserve the right to yeah. fire you and keep all the property of your business if they hit cold feet. Or at least they request that. That happened when the XPRIZE teams were competing against while we were competing against them. It was eye-opening to watch it happen. These people who had built this over 100 mile per gallon vehicle were fired because the venture capitalists didn't think they were on a fast enough track to making the revenue numbers they wanted, fired all of them, and their contracts said they were forbidden to continue working on their product because it's now owned by the venture capitalists, and they got no money. So they took a cash infusion, but it didn't go to them, and they ended up losing everything. And that's quite common. So they would ask us to forecast revenue to attract them, and yet, then yet what they're offering is something we're not really interested in. Can you imagine taking a mortgage on your house at 25% APR? then if we could forecast revenues accurately, we'd be in Vegas and we'd be rich. So we can't anyway, it's a lie. If we knew what any given company is going to do next quarter, we'd play the stock market and be rich. But we can't. So that's all a fallacy. Budgeting for the year ahead by predicting expenses is another thing that would be a pushback against Adeline and Scrum. Managers spend hundreds of hours predicting next year's budget and then hundreds of hours explaining budget over and underruns. They could have spent those hundreds of hours building stuff that moves the company forward, and it would have been the same. It goes back to a trust your people principle. So we get to cut out that entire level of overhead with actually and Scrum if the, if the company as a whole embraces it. And luckily for us, more and more companies are. And like Denny spoke about yesterday, more and more companies have to if they want to stay in business. And the, the shift report was a fantastic uh, metrics-based decision of that case. This is a significant reason why old thought businesses like GM and Chrysler declared bankruptcy. Some models of the dot-com bubble and the financial downturn are linked to this type of predictive financial modeling, which doesn't work and is intrinsically flawed. Agile Lean is from the answers to these problems. Trade predictions for being able to make changes rapidly and knowing as much about the current situation as possible. So instead of saying, what do I think is going to happen next quarter, say, what do I know about now? And spend that same amount of time gathering more information about now to feed your current sprint the next sprint. Only measure success met metrics. In our case, that's pretty straightforward. Working cars and efficiency. We don't want to measure anything else. It's overhead. Trade documentation for a product that clearly explains its use. Can you imagine if Internet Explorer came with a user's manual? We expect these things to be self-teaching and straightforward, and yet there's an enormous industry still built up around requiring documentation. We don't need to do that anymore. We have navigation systems in cars that can help teach you how to use anything unique about the vehicle the first time you step in, amongst many other methods, and we have to take the time to do that and retire old concepts like documentation because they all have a maintenance cost. Finally, trust your team. Without team trust, velocity starts to nose dive. <laughs> Ethics of the Manufacturing Revolution. Super dense slide. We're publishing it all online at the Scrum Alliance. Please read it. But this is, if you're going to be part of the businesses that survive in the next 10 years, what your business has to adopt from the top down. And what do I mean by the Manufacturing Revolution? If you look at a software team from the 1970s, they look a lot like a manufacturing factory now. They had rows of desks facing the same direction, and then a manager, school arm style, facing them, making sure no one's talking. And it's in a custom-built facility that in today's dollars would be 30 or 40 million dollars, if not more, where they have custom footings to support the servers, the computer, well, they weren't even servers yet, the computers they're working on, well, some of them. 
Then you look at a software team now, it's seven men and women in a coffee shop with laptops. Manufacturing still looks like that software company in the 1970s. New manufacturing, the quiet revolution, looks a lot more like seven people in a coffee shop, and those are the most profitable businesses, by the way. Google, Twitter, Facebook. Well, Twitter's not so wealthy, but very well known. <laughs> um, are the coffee shop model, and not the IBMs anymore. Manufacturing is trending that way, and that's just been enabled in the last two years by the democratization of precision machinery. We have a device now in the Wiki Speed Shop, a CNC router, that we got for $2,700, pocket change, that can print out to the 100th of an inch printout used loosely, but essentially just go straight from computer modeling, aluminum and foam that we can put carbon fiber over. So we can make any shape we want reliably as fast as we want for $2,700. Some people have these machines in their spare bedrooms. We have the advent of micro-manufacturing and mass customization, which we got to hear again, Denning speak about yesterday, is the path to uh, delight your customer and stay in business at all. And so this is the manufacturing revolution, and then these are the tenants that actually allow you to survive as posited by Wikispeed, as posited by me. And they have all types of cases like we trust our team. Some of these we got to mention, I got to mention earlier in the talk. This one I didn't get to go deep in. This avoids the culture of CYA, or cover your ass, which slows down innovation and kills morale. A company which spends, and this is the company I consulted to, which will remain nameless, spends six million on internet security, allowing employees to not see documents above their salary level, instead of six million dollars having interns and attorneys aggressively helping all levels of the org identify documents that are potentially libelous, which are usually a sign of an ethical action, and then they can be coached on how to rectify those situations as soon as possible as a company with help from all levels of the company. So what that's saying is, instead of making sure untrusted people within the company who are untrusted just because they weren't in high school with the owner, are, are kept from documents that give evidence that the company is making an ethical or libelous action, instead spend that money making sure the company is not doing an ethical or libelous action, and everyone's trusted in the company to support it faster. And that's so novel. At the same company where they spend $6 million on security, it just so happens that the printers in this company have access to every level of the company anyway. So all this money on security is actually undermined fundamentally by the fact that they care about printing, and everyone is coping with additional hours a day navigating the security structure, and then the time when it's down, and then everyone's shut down from gathering information. The waste is so huge, trying to perpetuate the idea that you need to keep information away from people. And the idea is, make sure you don't have information that needs to be kept away from people. <laughs> and your company will move faster and be less likely to be sued. It's kind of magic. <laughs> All of these stats are important and help explain how to run not just a Lean Agile Scrum team, but a Lean Agile Scrum business, and not just a Lean Agile Scrum software business, but a Lean Agile Scrum business of any type. This is Corey Lattice. He wrote Scrum Bun. He's holding an accelerator pedal, and he's in the Wikispeed shop in Seattle. This is the next big thing. So this is new and being announced today. So that throttle pedal he's holding we found in the XPRIZE that a whole lot of what we needed to do to improve vehicle efficiency required us to build an entirely new type of car and think about what makes a car different, differently, and from the ground up. A few of the things we found do apply to cars that are on the roads today and could make a Saab or a Ford Explorer or a Honda Civic Hybrid more efficient. Those are being packaged in our minimal, minimum marketable feature, our MMF to use lean startup terms. It's the smallest thing we can do that delivers value to the customer, and so the smallest thing that generates revenue for us, the quickest path to a sustaining business, our MMM, is the pieces that then increase the fuel economy of cars that are already on the road, so people don't have to trade it in to get a wiki speed, although you'll want to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a video all about that. When the deck is published, you can follow this link and, and learn much more, but I'll tell you about it. 
So here, this is on Monday of this week. This is after night one of the Global Scrum Alliance, uh, uh, the Scrum Alliance uh, session that we're all enjoying today. And so this is this is Monday. That's um, Matt Pollan and then two gentlemen I just met that day in Matt Pollan's office, this Wikispeed's distributed network. And what they're doing is programming our Arduino circuit board to be our new windshield wiper timer controller, our turn signals, and our hazard lights, making sure they're on the right timing as required by the Code of Federal Regulations. Then what they're doing is Wiki Speedlet. This is a close up of that Arduino board. This is one of the critical components that they're programming in a distributed collaborative way that improves the fuel economy of the cars that are around now based on what we learned in the XPRIZE. This isn't the whole thing, and you can't see the code that's in it anyway, unfortunately. But it's part of a solution that we're bringing to market as soon as responsible to make the little widget you plug into your car and get measurable fuel economy gains. Kind of neat. Huh. Next steps. <laughs> Let people know this works and how, so we can reduce global waste and increase global value. We want to help stop having factories look like software teams from the 1970s and suffer the same amount of waste that they were having. Um, the CFO of Solutions IQ gave a talk on Monday walking through the financial case for running your entire business using Scrum. And he came back with numbers in the tens of percents in terms of revenue gain. It was actually quite brilliant and very metric financial driven, uh, financial metric driven. It was similar to um, an MBA course the summary of it, the last lecture summarizing the, the semester course in business finance. And what would be the difference if you ran a company using traditional numbering systems and traditional management and, and waterfall management versus a scrum company. So not just scrum teams, but a scrum company. And ultimately, I think it came back to 41% before you even factor in the compounded gains of scrum if you were actually able to implement scrum across the entire org, like Wikispeed does. So, <laughs> we don't want that anymore. We want to reduce global waste. Whether you drive in 10 years a Wikispeed car or another 100 mile per gallon car, we're not too concerned. We're doomed to make millions of dollars anyway. <laughs> but we want to make sure it gets out there as soon as possible with at least as little waste as possible. Well, then we're iterating our passenger cars to increase user realized value and we're gonna indirectly make bazillions of dollars. We can speed lit to reduce the fuel consumption of existing automobiles. And right now we're in micro manufacture. We're prepping our Michigan car, the one that is in the North American National Auto Show, for customer lease. We have our first external customer leasing that car. We're prepping our Seattle car for a 2,249 mile road trip to verify it's a longer term shakedown of those systems past what we're able to do in the XPRIZE. We're pairing with Rouse Industries, the winnings we got from being a finalist in the XPRIZE, on our airbag module. We do a lot of complex math in computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis to verify the safety of our vehicle. An airbag system is really complex math. Roush does that for a living as a business, the, the Roush Industries. So they are doing our airbag system and fantastic to have the XPRIZE funds to do that from becoming a finalist in the XPRIZE. Then we're building an interactive exhibit for the Future of Flight Center at Boeing. When it's done, what's the user flow to own a wiki speed? Configure your car online, upload a JPEG of the graphics pack, and test drive it in a current gen driving game if you like. Now this is a set of stories on the backlog. Right now you send an email to info at wikispeed.com and say, I'd like to buy a car. And we say, great, you can PayPal us or mail a check to this address. <laughs> this is where we want to go. So what we can really use are a few people out here to do some software dev with us on our website. <laughs> you don't know a JPEG of the graphics pack you want, and you can click and buy it now. Then you'd be tweeting a picture of each module of your car as it's done, and then also of each test as it passes, so you know the miles per gallon and the zero to 60 of your vehicle before it's even finished being done and built. Um, and during that whole process, you'd have a chance to make upgrades or changes. So from a revenue standpoint, we've built upsell opportunity all the way in. Your tweet goes out, you choose to share it with your friends, and your friend says, oh, I can't believe you didn't get the Nürburgring suspension package. It's only another $900. And you go, is it too late to change? And you can't. <laughs> or you say, it doesn't cost any more to have silver wheels instead of the black wheels, or white wheels instead of the red wheels. I'll make that change. And you can. So greater customer delight, 
happens to be intrinsically linked with greater revenue opportunity, kind of magical, and it seems to come true all the time when we think about this critically. Um, then you pick up your car at a Wikispeed facility, and you get jumping high fives from the team that built your car. <laughs> 18 months later, this would never happen. We use a Honda engine that we then modify for higher efficiency slightly. They do a great job from the factory. But uh, your engine is running rough, so a repair scenario. You would stop by a Wikispeed center, so it would probably be Seattle, Washington for you guys, our shop, which is on 145th and Highway 99. And you drop off the engine module, and you plug in a loader in about five minutes, and you drive on your way. <laughs> Imagine that. We don't even know what the problem is yet. And then we have the engine to do regression testing on and figure out what went wrong and directly feed it into the next sprint. It, it, it just works really well when you start doing that kind of thing in sprint. Um, two years later, say, I always wanted the convertible. But I bought the Wikispeed truck. So incidentally, next we're doing a truck, and we're trying to get 100 miles per gallon with a truck body that actually has meaningful payload. So uh, we're working on that now. It's in the backlog next. So say you bought the truck six months from now when, when our first truck body is available. And uh, you say, but I've always wanted the convertible. Well, you could just buy the convertible body and bring your car to the Wikispeed shop and we'd set it on. or you could actually put it on yourself in about the time it would take to put snow tires on the car. Then, four years later, you buy our newest electric drivetrain module, swap it in like changing a tire, and you drop off the previous module at a Wikispeed location as a trade-in, as a credit against your new module. You haven't even had to buy a new car yet, now you have an electric convertible. <laughs> <laughs> Five years later, new crust structures and airbag systems are developed. We would offer them at cost. So something this modularity enables us to do is next generation ethics. Volvo makes most of their marketing spend on their safety, and for good reason. But if Volvo came up with an enhanced airbag or crush structure system that dramatically improves the safety of your car, you'd have to buy a new Volvo. There's no other way to get it. With Wikispeed, we can offer those modules at cost. And our commitment there is we believe in marketing on safety. It's very important to differentiate yourself in the marketplace by being safer. That's a good thing. But we believe it's not ethical to profiteer on safety. And so we make those offered at cost. So we don't lose money. But anytime customers want to opt in to the latest and greatest safety features, they can. So now you have an electric convertible that's even safer. And you still haven't had to buy a new car. <laughs> when can I buy one? How can I help? <laughs> Wikispeed.com slash wiki order. You can actually order one now. What we offer now are clones of our XPRIZE race car for people who want to own a piece of disruptive technology history or for people who say, this is the neatest thing ever, I want to support you guys. They're available at $28,886. We want to make them for $17,995. And we'll get there after we have a certain amount of CNC machinery that we don't have yet. That relies on some startup capital that we're looking for as domains or microinvestments. About 400 plus K dollars allows us to then make the car for 17995 Next up is a comfortable four-seat commuter car. So what we have now are clones of our XPRIZE race car. It's fast, it's quick, it's ultra-efficient. It doesn't have cup holders. It's kind of rough. It's a race car. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but, Next up is a comfortable commuter car with the amenities you'd expect. And the same fuel efficiency technology. The target for the first customer facing version of that would be 12 months after a 400k startup funding event. So we'll see. We'll see when that happens. We're about 12 months from delivering that from a funding opportunity of a 400k or higher level, which is nothing. At the North American International Auto Show, the domestic manufacturers built a building inside a building for $400 million, and then tore it down in two weeks because it was just their display building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're in debt. <laughs> <laughs> then, you're invited to join the team. Email info at wikispeed.com, and then come visit one of our shop locations on a Thursday. Every Thursday at 7 p.m., we have a shop tour showing people around what we're doing and how we're doing it and you could actually get physically involved, either remote doing software development or 
hands on building the car, whether you've ever done anything like that or not, or one of our cars, or there's a, there's a myriad of ways to get involved with Wikispeed, and they all start with an email to info at wikispeed.com, which incidentally is my personal email. So I get each one of those, and then I forward them onto the team. But I have a different challenge than that. Yes, we'd love you to donate to <coughs> Wikispeed through the PayPal button on our website. Yes, we'd like you to join the team. Yes, we'd like you to buy one of our cars, or 10 of them. But even cooler than that, this all happened in nights and weekends in what was spare time. Well, none of us have any spare time, really, so what did we give up? I would say that in the amount of time it would take you to get caught up on all four seasons of Lost, <laughs> or in about the time it would take you to watch one season of 24, you could change the world in a meaningful way. Maybe you coach Little League, which is something that's considered a good thing. But maybe in that same amount of time, you might be able to develop a vaccine that doesn't require refrigeration for rotavirus that you could send to folks suffering from rotavirus and save millions of infant and child deaths a year. In the same amount of time you spent coaching Little League for a season. So Little League coaching is a great thing. Maybe you could do something even greater. Watching all four seasons of Lost is, is cool, but it's not, you know, that great. You could absolutely switch that for changing the world in a positive way. I'm passionate about cars. You might be passionate about microfinance. In that same amount of time, you could probably have a working prototype of a microfinance application for mobile phones for folks living in sub-Saharan Africa. These guys and gals, the Nigerian diaspora, are still putting money under mattresses or carrying it on their person when they go out to work their plots of land. It's a problem. Theft happens and there's no investment opportunity. These people don't have access to a banking system. In that same amount of time, if your passion happens to be microfinance, you might be able to completely change these people's lives and give them some opportunities that are on par with what we have every day from our mobile phones here by providing some banking. If you used your power for good, you could use your power for awesome and make the world a better place. And if you did, it would be so cool. It would be like Mega Shark high fiving King Kong in front of an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and I challenge you to see if you can find just a little bit of free time one night a week or one weekend day a week and do something amazing. You could do it with Wikispeed, or you could do the other two examples I mentioned, or something else you're passionate about that makes the world a better place. Thank you. So if you have somewhere to be, and I'm sure you all do, go right ahead. You can email me and the team. If you have questions, feel free to come on up, or, or we can start hand-raising, too. I will stay until they say I've got to leave. Um, but for folks who need to go, I won't take it at all personally. I'm amazed you stayed through all of this. Thank you so much. How fast did you car go? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. How fast does the car go? Um, and I'm really sorry. I'm Carol McHugh, the Managing Director of Scrum Alliance, and I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming, making this gathering really awesome. And uh, all of the speakers that we had, all of the participants we had, it was really, really great. It was my first gathering, and um, I want to um, just put out a special thank you to Brian Stallings um, for all the work. because I love that question, it was how fast is the car, right? So there's a stat feed afterwards, which was cut from our uh, press conference at the North American National Auto Show. The car does go zero to 60 in five seconds, and it goes all the way up to 129 miles an hour, but that uses more gas. 
And so like in any car, when you floor it, it will go faster, but it will be less efficient. It just so happens that our car, when you floor it, is also impossibly fast, which was part of our race strategy, is that we could accelerate very quickly, fairly efficiently, or very slowly, extremely efficiently, and we had the choice to do both, and then it could cruise very efficiently in any case. Um, there's the new modular body style. The car weighs 104 pounds in its current iteration and seats four adults. Holds 20 grocery bags. Pretty ridiculous stuff. And we have a 400 mile range on a four gallon gasoline tank. Um, other questions? What over here? Oh, yeah, uh, there's two. Uh, the one behind first in the green uh, structure. I was just going to ask uh, quarter mile time. Yeah. Oh, our quarter mile time. Actually, the one. Sorry. Yeah, I, I always did rolling starts, so I, I don't have uh, I don't have a quarter mile time for you. What I can say is you're invited to come to the Wiki Speed Shop, and we have access to um, Evergreen Raceway and also the landing strip at South Seattle Community College, so we can find out. <laughs> then there's a question in front. Pretty light like question. Did anyone ever claim by taking picture of your car that they saw you before? <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone ever claim by taking a picture of our car they saw you? Oh, we, uh, <laughs> no. But we have had a lot of people say um, that uh, it was so aggressive looking, especially the car at the auto show, that it really reminded them of a military stealth fighter, especially in that matte carbon fiber that we used at the auto show. That happened, <laughs> that happened a number of times. Uh, a question right here in the front. So you, you've been at the auto shows. Anybody who's a major manufacturer come up and say, shit, why don't we do this? So <laughs> what do other major manufacturers say when they come up and talk to us at auto shows? Like I mentioned, we were between Ford and Chevrolet. I didn't know how that was going to go. We were there with this disruptive technology and small companies like us have never been on the main floor before. Absolutely, sea levels from all major automotive manufacturers, manufacturers came by. I expected maybe there would be a buyout to absorb us into a research arm of their company. I thought maybe there would be a buyout to keep us quiet or an assassination attempt or I don't know. <laughs> we actually were met with nothing but well wishes, handshakes. Some of, their, some of their employees joined our team as volunteers and they sent their recruiter over to talk to us in Tesla's case, which was extremely flattering because I'm a big fan of what Tesla's doing. So we were met with instead Congratulations, people saying it's about time, handshakes, well wishes, and support, which is not all that I expected, but it probably the most heartening. And then there's a question right here. Yeah, I work for Boeing, so I have questions. Can we make a play in this model? So it was, I work for Boeing. Can, the, can you make a plane in this model? And uh, well, well, the short answer is absolutely. And then the even more amazing answer. <laughs> you can turn your pickup into a plane. <laughs> 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 if only you knew how right you were. Um, <laughs> so, our car. Yeah, so here's the frame, right? Maybe this is a good side impact test. Here's the frame. And you have the suspension module at this corner, and the suspension module at this corner, and the engine module rolls in and attaches here with six structural levers. It just so happens <laughs> that since you can attach anything here and it's structurally rated, it's actually balanced and weight into the weight, uh, the low enough weight to become a canard aircraft where you have wings in the front, wings in the rear, and a pusher prop in the rear. <laughs> I'm not saying I recommend it, but uh, you can. And because you can't, we are annoying you. You can or tank treads or anything you want on this car, but one, you can build a plane using these methods. Scrum, agile, lean, applied to business has dramatic impact on any business model we've attempted to apply it to so far. And although we haven't built a plane yet, it looks perfectly applicable. And it just so happens that modularity enables you to fly your car. <laughs> uh, there, in the back in the dark blue. Uh, I'm curious if you're playing with a small car show, how would you choose Top Gear? Oh, Top Gear. I and, and, am. And Fast, but if you could be up there with your car, that would be 
So the, the question was, have you thought about being on car top gear? Because wouldn't that be awesome? And I'd love to see you get on their speed board. I, I know you're not the fastest car in the world. That wasn't what you were built for. But you're pretty quick. It'd be neat to see you contend with exotic, ultra expensive cars built with traditional methods. And uh, I would love to be on Top Gear. I don't yet have a contact in Top Gear. And so each enormously huge thing for us that we've done, like be at Future of Flight and have an exhibit there, or be in the North American International Auto Show, we had to then apply to the process where they contacted us because they've seen us in other venues. If we had a contact at Top Gear, I would immediately follow up and I wouldn't have to think for two seconds to be a big fan. And then the other part was their speed test, their, their having their SIG pilot the car on the track. We actually should be fast enough to be on the leaderboard. We, I don't think we'd be at the bottom. To your point, um, some of the fastest cars in the world at more than a million dollars a piece are significantly faster than our current iteration. <laughs> but again, that that engine module is swappable, right? And we built the car for much higher performance specs in case a customer were as concerned with fuel economy. So <laughs> depending on what we wheeled in, we maybe could hang at the top potentially. And then did you have a follow-up question? I, I saw oh, that. I like, no, I'm just really excited for you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any contacts there? I haven't, no, but I, I'm a brilliant to make that kind of Sure have. Yes. <laughs> Info at WikiSpeed. <laughs> So the, if I follow, it was the car body is really, really low looking, really, really low looking. Can it clear a speed bump? And, uh, and, and the answer is yes. We actually dialed it to uh, comfortably uh, pass any speed bump in the United States that meets uh, state, state regulation or federal regulation. Um, and that was absolutely intentional because although it looks like a supercar and it kind of is, it's also <laughs> really meant to be a family car. And, uh, and, and so we had to address that. But we did something intentional with our styling. Not only is it low and flat like a race car, but it's actually as high as uh, the car I drive around right now, a Honda Civic Hybrid, and then I, I've got a, a Subaru Impreza. And it's, it's as high as those cars. But we put this bright orange reflective strip that says WWW Wiki Speed on it, and that visually brings your eye down, and it makes it look even lower than it is, which I like. But uh, it's a stylistic change. A lot of cars now have a, have a darker body cladding cladding at the bottom part of the car to visually bring your eye up to the paint of the car. So it looks like it has even more ground clearance than it does. But inches per inches were actually the same as many cars on the road now. Just a, a styling change to play your eye. I believe so this like, question I is next. Since, since you're talking about airplanes and other kind of weird stuff, I was just thinking, has anybody ever thought about your your suspension, sort of like raising one wheel or jumping? Oh, sure. So it was, the, the question if I understood it, you talked about how your suspension is modular and individual, so you can change just one wheel at a time if you had a reason to do so. Um, has anyone thought about some type of jumping system? I mean, and I imagine... To get over speed bumps, even. Yeah, that, the, that it, it might even be talking about biomimicry. Uh, like we heard a fantastic talk from David Socha and... Uh, William Roden. William Roden, right, um, uh, just a couple of days ago here at this conference. And what's neat is it's limitless, and I hope we have a very near future where people are making their own modules, innovating independently, even outside of Wikispeed, which is already this distributed collaborative team that anyone can join. But people even outside of Wikispeed making uh, compatible modules and then sending them to us for safety certification. So we can say, yes, we endorse this product to keep your warranty, we love it. If we really love it, we would actually help you resell it, that kind of thing. I hope to make that kind of ecosystem, not unlike an app store, but it's a car. Um, and so if someone might do something like jumping. That said, we don't have any pneumatic or um, airbag suspension system currently along that line. But we do have, we've got more than 16 iterations of our suspension system. None of them are active, to your point. Um, in, in, in towards the back, in the black. Um, I have a chapter. question about uh, the composite that you're using and how you were able to come up with that. You 
know, an inexpensive way to do that and that type of thing. So I have a really great idea to use a composite like that for another product. Yes, we can absolutely talk. It was, I've got an idea to use composites like you're using. We might have information to exchange. Please email info at wikispeed.com. About our composites, I don't know if I got to mention this part. We built an entire car body sized composite. We innovated a new process, and it costs less than $1,000 per car body out of structural carbon fiber, which is ridiculous and is not done by anyone. And that's the kind of thing that happens all the time when you use Adeline Scrum. Um, then I think far left was the next question. Yeah, so uh, to further transform the world of work, we'd love to see you do a TED Talk. Oh man, I would love to do a TED Talk. Yeah. <laughs> Opportunity. If there were a TED menu that thought I'd be a valuable ad, I also wouldn't hesitate to be a part of it. Um, please let me know if there's an overlapping TED talk where I, I might fit in and add value to the, the cause they were trying to push. Do you have a contact there? No, we have uh, If, if anyone work. does, please info at eastpeed.com. <laughs> straight back. Have we tested it in the snow? Yes. In fact, the first tires, just because of time of year and that I was in Denver, Colorado, were snow tires. The very first ones. And what's interesting is when you're in a front engine, rear wheel drive car, like say a Ford Mustang or a Chevrolet Corvette, um, the weight is, uh, the majority of the engine weight is over the front wheel. <laughs> weight distribution might be equal, but when you corner, the center of mass and the center of rotation is towards the front, which makes the drive wheels unsettled, and it handles not quite as well in the snow. You can drive even those cars in the snow if you drive them carefully in the snow tires, but it's more challenging. So a lot of us find we have an easier time in a front engine, front wheel drive configuration, where the front engine is directly over the wheels, holding them with their snow tires. Well, Wikispeed is mid-engine rear-wheel drive. The engine is still directly over the driven tires. It's actually quite a bit easier to drive in the snow than most other rear-wheel drive vehicles, and it's a lot closer to a front-engine, front-wheel drive car in the snow. Um, anything else? You guys are phenomenal. There, there is already. Uh, yes, the gentleman mentioned. Anything for like air conditioning or I mean, you said, you know, family car? Yeah, the question was, what about air conditioning? You said a family car, right? So the X Prize actually required us to have air conditioning, heat, defrost, and a stereo. It was a race for ultra efficient vehicles, but they wanted them to be vehicles that people would want to own, and at least 10 cubic feet of cargo capacity, which, as I mentioned, we have more than double that. Um, by the nature of our modular design, we have to keep iterating and keep adding back chunk space. But yes, we have an air conditioner, a heat, and a frost, and a stereo. And in fact, next up, we're integrating an iPad or Android tablet dock into the dash. So we're, we're actually on the bleeding edge of some of it, the comfort features as well, or, or at least iterating on being there right now. Um, any other? Oh, already. Uh, yes. So how much software is in the car? How much software is actually in the car? So. How much? That, that's interesting. Um, I guess I can say less than a meg, but and, and, you know who knows what that means? Are we an assembler or whatnot? Which is, in this number I, I am saying an assembler. Um, but maybe it's easier to answer in terms of person hours or effort. In the car, there's at least 50 backlog items worth of software, and we care about that very much. And then, uh, as mentioned, the purchasing scenario that I mentioned on the website that is yet to be built, there's an enormous amount of software built out to support any company, as we all know, including a company like Wikispeed. So our website needs love. I love a few people. Um, <laughs> and there's quite a bit of software there. In the car, I'd say easily 50 backlog items worth of software. Um, did that come close to answering your question? Ish. Okay. Um, yes. The iPad just for consumer use or are you using that for instrumentation and operating the car? So we want to have a system that we have complete confidence in its reliability for essential systems of the car. So at this stage in the game, the iPad or Android tablet would be used for navigation, audio, potentially climate control driving, um, the, the accessory part of your dash panel. We will iterate and test many other uses, because there's a whole lot you can do with a device like that. But to start with, 
those are the launch features, and it will likely always be separate from instrumentation for, honestly, reliability reasons, so we can use hardened systems. An iPad or an Android tablet is a fantastic, durable device. It's different than a hardened system for automotive or industrial use, so we have simple, inexpensive hardened systems for, for those purposes where it, where it could be critical. But what about monitoring where it's not? What about monitoring where it's not critical? Absolutely, those are perfect candidates, perfect candidates. The Nissan GTR is a contemporary example of that, where they have a screen designed by the people who make Gran Turismo, the driving game, that gives you ancillary metrics about the car, and it runs just like a PlayStation does. But then they still have their separate critical functions indicators. So uh, that's a perfect example. I, another, you guys are amazing. Uh, yes, in the back. Are the engine rear drivers going to be, or that, is that the future? My favorite car I ever had was the engine rear driver. I'm so glad that we are doing that. Are mid engine rear wheel drive cars the future? And he was lucky enough to own a mid engine rear wheel drive car, and it was his favorite car he ever had. Um, Mid-engine rear-wheel drive cars are currently the most efficient in terms of energy to the road. There's a few disruptive technologies that aren't yet right that might change the game. The real end state, which right now it's a less efficient layout by a large margin, if we figure out how, we being all of humanity, how to, what would these things work on it? How to uh, <laughs> make this layout efficient, the ultimate layout is center of mass at the center of rotation, which is at the center between the wheels and height-wise, so the center of the wheelbase and center of the track, and at hub height. So usually that's your engine. So in the middle of the car to your point, but then independent power levels to all four wheels. So right now, the most complex system that I know about is Honda and Acura's super handling all-wheel drive, as they call it. Pretty, pretty catchy name, and it warrants it for how complicated the system is. Uh, especially for how simply they were able to build it. It's actually not that much of a maintenance headache. And what they do is they have power in the front wheels and then a coupler to adjust how much power goes to the rear wheels. So you have independent power levels front and rear. And then they have independent split for rear wheel. The front wheels are linked though. They have a, a viscous coupling, but it's different than actively driving the front wheels different amounts. So as far as I know, we're not yet in, in any production vehicle at independent power levels for all four wheels, but that's the grand ultimate and mid-engine. So we'll get there. Um, so right now, the most efficient, closest step to that is mid-engine rear-wheel drive, but the future is going to be all wheels independently driven, independently braking, and independent steering, which Rob Airsport is working on in Team <laughs> uh, Two at once, you guys are There's amazing. Follow that. Is, is that more efficient than engine per wheel? Is that more efficient than engine per wheel? In terms of maintenance, currently, sadly, yes, because engine per wheel, if we're talking about something like a hub motor, we tend to have a higher failure rate because of the vibration of the motor itself and the drive shaft itself is exposed to. And so in terms of maintenance, we lose efficiency. In terms of, if we're able to, and I hope we are soon, able to overcome the reliability issue that's introduced when you have an engine per wheel, usually closely located with the wheels that have room for all four, It depends, because if you have a transmission per wheel, you lose an enormous amount of efficiency when the wheel could just be coasting. And then you have extra weight, even if you're decoupling and you have a clutch, you're then carrying around all that extra weight. So the end state is probably going to be something like an engine per wheel with a centralized center of mass, but we don't have tech to make that more efficient, more reliable, or more performant than mid-engine rear wheel drive yet. So, that's where you're going with this. Then, right next to you, you uh, there was a question. Yeah, would I be able to swap my modules myself? <coughs> would you be able to swap your modules yourself? Yes. Each module is built so that if you're comfortable changing a tire, you will be able to change your module. And they're all the weight of similar to a tire or rolling so that you, you don't have to have anything like a crane or six friends. Right. Now, when you're, changing the <laughs> when you're changing the body, so you're going from your pickup truck to your sports car to your family sedan to your convertible and back again, it's much easier with two people, one on the front one on the back. Um, and you can have as many people as you'd like, and it is possible with one person. 
But it's this big bulky thing, even though it doesn't weigh much because it's structural carbon fiber, but it's bulky. Um, it's much easier for two people to lift off and set to the side. There's, you guys are amazing. <laughs> I, yes, in the front, in the blue shirt. You, you had a picture where you, where you described the reason you did the doors the way you did was so that because the body's wider, you wouldn't bang into other people. Right. What about other people because you're wider banging into you when they open their doors? Sure. We're not that much wider. Okay. So, they, so the ideal parking scenario is your doors open, you're able to walk even around the front of the car without closing the door if you wanted to, or just walk out the back where you get out and you close the door and you go by. We wanted it to be so that you could always walk past and close the door, so you could go get groceries or put something away, back or forward. So we enabled an additional user user story. Um, but uh, we're not much wider than a standard car, so we're not much more likely to them opening their door and us. Also, most cars then have their rearview mirror sticking out past the car. Um, and then the rear view mirror is typically high, but depending on where they open their door, our car is thinner than most cars' rear view mirrors, and our rear view mirrors are over the car, so we don't add extra width, if that helps explain at all. Um, there was another question a moment ago, it probably was you in the, in the green shirt. Okay. So you told us a lot about the frame and, and the body and some of the innovations around that. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about some of your favorite innovations in the drive train. Oh, sure, some of our favorite innovations with the drive train. We got to talk about the chassis and its safety and the modularity, the innovations in the drivetrain itself. So we found that when you look in your spam folder of your email client and you see all the emails that say, fuel efficiency technology, buy this now, they all work, most of them work a little bit, a fraction of a percent, not worth the price you pay. And it is kind of a scam, but they actually have some validity behind them, or could, if you do it a slightly different way. They almost make sense. And so maybe my favorite thing was looking at all these kind of hacky, not net net very efficient technologies, and when you put them all together, you get like a meaningful 4% increase. And I thought that was kind of hilarious, because it's stuff everybody knows about and is sitting in our spam folders now. But you can mind that. There's some genuine information there, and combine them together and get a net net higher efficiency gain. Now that wasn't core to us because that wasn't a massive improvement, but I thought that was kind of awesome. So maybe, maybe that's my favorite thing that we found in the engine tech. Uh, any other? Oh, already in the back. Yes. Yeah, sure. Unfortunately, if in a car accident, how do you repair this car? Sure. If you were to unfortunately get in a car accident, how do you repair this car? <laughs> Modules. So, I unfortunately have been in two car accidents in Ricky Speed cars. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for me, Luckily, the finite element analysis that shows how the energy absorbs is in, in a car and by how much and, which, and in what direction it channels the load was true. Luckily, we have